on Wednesdays today after lecture, and we'll just confirm we're all on the same page in terms of their review. But we're, we're meeting and talking all the time, so you will know that what they're saying is reflecting what will be on the exam. Um, also, obviously, what I have at the end of every lecture, I'm being um, faithful to that and double checking that I don't put something on that I say you don't have to know. Um, so then on Friday as well, we're going to have a very short um, bit of new material that's really just pulling thing, a couple things together and which will not be on the exam, but just like, I think you'll be interested actually with the hormone regulation and parts of the body. With one eye clicker quiz, the last one. And then 30 minutes will be like what's important for the exam, also talking about the big concepts. And then the last 10 minutes will be the teacher evaluation. So that's online, but we've been told that it's most effective to do it during class so that people actually do it. Um, and then on Monday, I have my usual office hours from 4 to 6. If you still need additional consultation or want to ask questions, um, the building caution locks at 5.30, so you want to get in before 5.30. And then Tuesday is the exam. We'll be posting this multiple places about um, where you'll be going with your name. But essentially, it's a similar setup to last time. I think one of the rooms is different. The Duenal is a little bit of just a slightly different um, room within that building. And DSP students will start at 6.30. Yeah? Uh, no. Uh, is class is there no class Monday, or do we start at the day? I'm pretty sure you're starting the new section. I just met with your teacher, your instructor, about um, actually using clippers. It's also her first time, so hopefully you're all registered now, so it'll be much easier for her. Yeah. We have class. Yeah, so nothing new from Friday will be on the exam, those 10 minutes. But you definitely will want to be here because there'll be an eye clicker and then also going over what's important for class and evaluations. I just don't think it's that fair to have like a whole bunch of new material on that Friday because you don't have time with your GSIs either. So, yeah. Any more like procedural questions before we move on? So today we're talking about carbon assimilation, and this is responsible ultimately for nearly all biological energy. So we're going to talk about Rubisco, this Calvin-Benson cycle, often just referred to as the Calvin cycle, um, the regular a little bit about the regulation of it, about C4 photosynthesis and photorespiration, and finally CAM photosynthesis. It sounds like a lot, but um, it's, it's actually not that much. We might even finish early. So if we look at this overview of photosynthesis, which hopefully you've all seen this type of a slide many times in your history um, of education. So basically, we talked about last time, right, that the light reactions were converting um, water to O2 and really unusual, right, to be able to actually use water um, and in this case, they're uh, producing NADPH and ATP, and those are dependent on light, and we have this um, photophosphorylation responsible for the NADPH and ATP. Now we're focused here on carbon assimilation, and this is where we're using the NADPH and ATP to turn CO2 into carbohydrate. So here, right, we're turning CO2 into carbohydrate. And this is, right, going from CO2 to a carbohydrate is anabolism or a synthesis. And whenever we're talking about synthesis, we're usually talking, or almost always talking about requiring ATP and reductant, as opposed to catabolism, right, where you actually generate energy and usually generate reductant. 
So when we talk about the assimilation of CO2 into biomass, we have CO2 taking the ATP and NADPH from the light reactions, the photophosphorylation, to make triose phosphates. So again, right, the words tell you a lot. The triose, right, would be three carbon, and there's a phosphate group on there, and then that could make it into the six carbons, like glucose six phosphate, for example. Um, and then these have different fates. It can go for sucrose, um, which is how sugar is transported in the plant. It can go for storage, so instead of glycogen, you have starch in the plant. It can go to be used to make the cell wall, or for pentose phosphates and all these intermediates, like DNA, RNA, etc. So, um, there are actually three five major scientists behind the assimilation of CO2. Calvin, who was here at Berkeley, so the Calvin lab is named after him, um, and he got the Nobel Prize for this in 61. And I'll actually post the Nobel Prize um, lecture. So it's, it's kind of cool. Um, after you get the Nobel Prize, usually it's quite removed from when you make the discovery. But after you get the Nobel Prize, you, you should write a lecture about it. Like you a lecture and then you write a paper. And those papers are so interesting because basically it's that scientist reflecting on what led to the discovery. And often what led to the discovery are actually advances, often technical advances, um, and then obviously insight and creativity, um, as well as being um, very rigorous. So we're going to talk a little bit about what allowed this advance to happen um, right here in Berkeley. And so Benson was also involved and James Batson. So the basic pathway for CO2 assimilation, which happens in the chloroplastroma. So all of this that we're um, focused on is for C3 plants to start. So basically what happens is the three phases. So CO2 is coming in, and the first stage is fixation by resistor. We're going to go through each part in, in a minute, <laughs> um, to 3-phosphoglycerate, right? And then, so this has three carbons, one, two, three, and then you reduce it. So you're putting in the ATP and the reducing power of NADPH. In the stroma, this is dominant of the chloroplast to make glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And then from here, we'll go through this, but um, one gets pulled off. If you have a number of these, like six, one gets pulled off and then five goes forward. And we're gonna go through those steps. So let's talk a little bit more about the discovery. So um, there were a number of things that allowed this to happen, but one was actually um, the war efforts. So a lot of the use of um, isotopes was actually that kind of initial work was done up on the hill at the Lawrence Berkeley lab. And when they were basically creating the first radioisotopes, one of the ones that they also created was carbon-14, so C14. And so to look at photosynthesis, um, they needed a way to be able to figure out. So they knew it was happening, but they didn't know like what order of what, what was happening, what were the reactions, what were the problems, like the intermediates of this process. And so you often have to go to a system that works. So in this case, they used chlorella, which is a, an algae. And the reason, and this is called the lollipop structure, the reason they used chlorella is they could actually get a thin monolayer of this in this structure, shine light, and then also they could, you can see here there's like a structure and, and a release, so they could like shine light and then at like two seconds, five seconds, whatever, a minute, they could um, basically have a small part of it come out and then quench it in alcohol and then figure out the next advance we'll talk about in a second, what were the products. So basically they would shine light and at different time points, they would release a little bit, quench it immediately and analyze the results. Um, and so this is actually, and this is a stable isotope, and this is how um, they were able to figure out what was going on. So it has a really long pathway. So in this case, um, uh, we're going to go through what was happening. The other advance actually was once they quenched it, 
you had to actually try to figure out what the compounds were, and you had a whole bunch of them. And so actually chromatography was also really new. So for everyone here, you're like, what? That was new? But that was actually very new in terms of separating molecules by polarity and charge and other features. And so the combinations that allowed them to figure out uh, what the different products were. And it actually took <coughs> 10 years from after they got the first um, results to then um, um, continue with that. So, yeah. okay, so you have your isotope and then you're able to follow it. So within the um, isotope, right, so they have this labeling that happened. So they clenched it really fast. The first one was at five seconds, and 80 to 90 percent of this uh, 14 carbon was in um, CO2. I mean, sorry, I just said the wrong thing. Was in PGA, which is three phosphoglycerate. So you know they did this shorter periods and longer. And the first one that was being labeled was this. Initially, it was just this spot, right? So they were able to separate. Here's the chromatography paper. And they had different solvents, different polarity, um, and they were able to figure out that um, they had this spot and that this was the first one. And then, like I said, it took them like another 10 years to figure out what the spots were. So then, when you go longer, so now this is at 30 seconds, so that was five seconds and 30, you're already seeing a lot of these getting labeled, which then over time they figured out all of these. So if we look at the pathway, right, the very first thing that was labeled was this. So initially, like I said, you have a label coming in, you have a spot, and then you have to figure out what it was. Yeah, back there. Oh, okay. How about that? All right. So if we go back, right, the first spot after five seconds, they figured out was uh, three phosphoglycerate, and then you could go time after time after time, and you could figure out the other spots. Now, of course, if something was channeled, you wouldn't see a spot here. So that could be a kind of, kind of question that you would get on the exam, right? Because you wouldn't actually ever see it. You would just get the next part. Um, and at 30 seconds, they saw it going into the sugar diphosphates and to even citric acid cycle products. So it was already moving through um, to other um, metabolic processes, like through here. So now we're going to look at this pathway in more detail. So this was figured out, and then over time we got to learn a lot more about the enzymes involved in each of these steps. So the first one is Rubisco, um, which you've heard a lot about. So Rubisco is actually doing this carboxylation. So whenever you see like carboxy, right, you know there's something's going to happen with CO2. So in this case, right, we have ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. So two phosphates on the one and five position, CO2 is coming in, um, and then you have Rubisco catalyzing the reaction where you end up getting two, three phosphoglycerates, and one of them has the CO2. Okay. So you're not going to need this to know this exact mechanism, um, just to know that you actually get these two products, and one of them has the CO2. Right. And you can actually count the carbons if you needed to figure out that they didn't both go, because you'd have if they didn't both acquire a CO2 because you have one, two, three, four, five, and here you have six carbons, so you only need that CO2 from one. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this enzyme. So um, we're talking about it right now in the C3 plants. And um, it has eight large subunits and eight small, and it's a complex structure. In bacteria, it's a little bit less complex, only the small subunits. Um, it has both carboxylase and oxygenase activity, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Um, it's a very interesting enzyme. So it evolved right when there actually was very little oxygen available in the atmosphere. And so it didn't have to worry, right, about competing this competition between CO2 and oxygen as a substrate. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. It's very slow. So how does the, the cell get around this? It has make it makes a lot more of it. So when I say slow, it's only converting um, three CO2 per second. So in terms of enzyme activity, this is very slow. So in order for carbon assimilation to take place, 
you actually need a ton of rubisco. And if you grind up plants and just look at the proteins, half, like 50% of the protein in a plant is rubisco. Um, and in fact, it's the most dominant nitrogen sink, right, in the world because enzymes, right, have amino acids, which all have a nitrogen in them. So just think about all that nitrogen that's sitting there, it's rubisco. Um, so sometimes people call this like, um, that it's not very efficient evolutionarily, but there's a reason in terms of like how our atmosphere evolved and how plants evolved that um, it has this function. So it's been extensively studied. We now have some really beautiful crystal structures um, and scientists have also worked to improve rubisco activity um, and particularly the carboxylase activity, but it hasn't been much progress. And you'll see um, how actually plants different plants have adapted to actually improve this efficiency. They've come up with strategies, and so scientists are actually um, improving on the strategies that plants have also come up with. So I'm gonna mention it again, but one thing that's quite interesting is that um, if you look at the reaction, right, with climate change, as CO2 increases, it would actually favor the carboxylation reaction and CO2 fixation. But typically, you know, climate change is accompanied by increased temperature, and the oxygenase activity is favored as temperature increases. So scientists really didn't know what to predict in terms of how um, what we predict would happen with climate change would impact plants and different types of plants. And so there's these huge experiments that have now been going on for as much, I'm trying to think how old I am, because when I actually did um, climate change research for a little bit. So yeah, so probably at least 20 years. Um, so huge experiments in forests and grasslands and different areas where you have huge nets set up where CO2 was being pumped in. There were efforts to raise the temperature and control that as well. And these were done over years um, to see the impacts. And they were complex, as you might this might suggest. So let's look in detail a little bit more. So Rubisco, right, is catalyzing this CO2 fixation. And um, we're not going into the details of the exact reaction mechanism, but because we have this theme of uh, regulation, I just wanted to mention two ways that it's regulated. So one is by covalent modification called carbamylation. So another covalent modification, so another theme, right, would be phosphorylation, which we've talked about over and over. But in this case, carbamylation, you're adding a CO2. And basically, that CO2 is going on to, whenever it's covalent, right, it's being attached to usually an amino acid, or almost always an amino acid side chain, in this case, lysine. And that would be indicative, right, of sufficient CO2 and this presence of CO2. So, um, then once that CO2 is um, on that lysine group of rubisco, actually magnesium then is attracted to those, um, that negative charge on the uh, oxygen groups, and then that is the active form of the enzyme. There's another um, way that this is um, regulated, and that's by inhibition, by a natural transition state analog, which we're not gonna go into, but that rises in the dark. So again, there are two ways of regulating it. One, when you have the CO2 present, and then the second, when um, it's dark, there's this natural transition state analog. So if we go back to then um, the stages of the reaction, so now we're gonna look at, over here, reduction in this part. So you'll notice that some of these look familiar. And so, in some cases, these um, enzymes that we're going to talk about in this cycle um, are also used in glycolysis, um, but it's the reverse reaction, and instead of NADH, it's NADPH. So when you look at the glycolysis reactions, you can look at these in parallel and see that they're reversed and that they're using NADPH because these occur in the stroma as opposed to occurring. Um, like glycolysis in the cytosol. So in this case, um, we're going from 3-phosphoglycerate, we're putting in ATP, this is a kinase, again, cluing you into that, a, that you're gonna have a phosphoryl transfer, and in this case, you're actually adding it to the compound to get 1,3-bis um, phosphoglycerate. 
This is magnesium dependent. We're gonna look more at the role of magnesium in these reactions. This is somewhat of a new theme for you. Um, based on the last lecture, I talked about uh, photophosphorylation and the fact that you have these changes in pH that occur um, with light and with photophosphorylation, you also have a change in magnesium concentration. So the second reaction is 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. You're putting in NADPH. Again, this is really similar to the one in glycolysis, except it's NADP that it's using instead of NAD. Um, and then it's um, creating glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, something we are all familiar with, and then the, um, it's being oxidized to NADP. So these reactions are actually uh, thermodynamically unfavorable, right? And so um, what drives them? And so again, you would be able to figure this out, that so the delta G standard of these two together is um, not favorable, it's positive. But when you actually have this high concentration of NADPH and this high concentration of ATP, which happens in the stroma after the light reactions, based on last lecture, right, photophosphorylation, that drives these forward, okay? So you would be able to calculate that based on delta G prime being equal to delta G standard prime plus, right, the concentration ratios. So now we're going to move into um, what's happening in this last phase of the regeneration. So you might, when you're reviewing this, need to go through and like count the carbons. Um, so basically, um, as we go through the cycle, we're going to go, we're going to have three of these coming in with three CO2s, right? So you'll have five carbons times three is 15, right? Plus three is 18 to make three phosphoglycerates, so six three carbons. Okay, so you want to make sure all your carbons add up. Then you go through this reduction stage um, where you're basically just converting 3 phosphoglycerate to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, and you're using up ATP and NADPH from the light reaction. And so you have six of these, right? And then one of them goes off and can be used for other things. So your product is one of those, and then the other five go back into the cycle. Okay, so this is being cycled back to regenerate um, regulus 1, 5, this phosphate to then have another CO2 come in. So we're going to focus right now on this regeneration stage. So I know it looks crazy. We're going to walk through it, and it's going to remind you a lot of the regeneration in the um, pentose phosphate pathway. So we're having five carbons, five C3 carbons go to three C5 carbons, so 15 to 15. And I have them numbered, but if you look at this, you won't understand the number until we talk about it. So basically, these numbers, the one, two, three, four, five, are all the C3s coming in. And then the um, Roman numeral one, two, threes are the um, C5s, three C5s that are you're coming out. So if you look at this, the first thing is this interconversion. It's not shown here, but it's triose phosphate isomerase, and we know that um, from uh, other cycles that we talked about. So then we have conversion. You don't need to memorize all of these. Um, if you had a question about this on the exam, it would be um, more about the logic of it. So here, right, you have two of these C3s coming in to make uh, C6, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so you know fructose is a C6, but then also um, you can count them here. That's what these little um, dots are, is the number of carbons. So from here, right, you're actually getting this transfer, again, just like the alveolase and the ketolase and the pentose phosphate regeneration, um, to get glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Sorry, to get, where are you? The first regulus phosphate. So you have three plus six to give you five, ultimately plus four. So the carbons are always being balanced, but you're just getting these two carbon and typically two and three carbon shifts. Okay. 
<coughs> so you get your first one here. So you would just need, like if you saw this in exam, to be able to follow what was coming in and out to get from five to three. And then the same thing is happening, right? One of these is going here, and you need another, um, so here you have a four carbon, you need another three carbon, you make a seven. This is a theme, right, of having the, of making something that's a six or a seven compound, and then that's converted back to the form that you want here, right? You're getting a five compound and a, another five that can be converted back to regular compound phosphate. So I'm not going through the details, but I'd like you afterwards to go through the logic of what's happening in terms of this conversion of carbonates. So a couple of the enzymes we're going to talk about more are ones that are unique to plants in this process. The first was Robisco, we just talked about, and then Sedulose, um, Hepsilose 1,7-bisphosphate, which is here, and then this enzyme right here. So you can see from this reaction, right, that quite a few of these um, are probably, are very similar to things that we're seeing in glycolysis and um, this also peptide phosphate pathway. And so in this case, right, the ones that are unique to plants are only these three. In this case, um, just following the logic of what's happening as well, you want to always look at where are you using ATP, so you have one, two, three ATPs that are used in this regeneration, right? One, two, three. And then you also want to look at your phosphates, and you have phosphate and phosphate coming off here. So if we look at this coming around again now, we have the six. So when you have this right in front, that's the number of those. So you have six C3 compounds. Six ATPs are coming in. Then you get six of the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. That can be cleaved, right? We have the phosphates on the two ends of the molecule. It can be cleaved in the middle. We get the two glyceraldehyde phosphates um, and the dihydroxyacetone phosphate through the isomerization. Um, and then we have pulling off that one for use in other things. We've rotated the wheel cycle um, from the last drawing. Um, and then we have this regeneration of regular stuff like this phosphate. So if we look at the summary, right, if you have this, um, you always want to focus on where you're putting in ATP, where you're putting in reductant, um, and in this case, the phosphate coming off. So you have three CO2, you have nine ATP, right? Six plus three is nine. You have six NADPH. These again are coming from photophosphorylation, right here, plus H plus. Um, and then in the end, you have the one that comes off, right? The triosphosphate coming off, plus, we'll start with this part, the NAD and the NADP, and then only eight phosphates, because one of the phosphates went into this molecule. So to balance it, right, you had nine phosphates that were released here, but one goes into this molecule coming off. So from there, we have this triose um, phosphate, and so what is the fate of that? So if we're talking about here, right, the glyceraldehyde three phosphate, which can be isomerized to the dihydroxyacetone phosphate, so these are both tri triophosphates. So the big thing that happens, the dominant thing, is this recycling that we just talked about to rigulous 1,5-bisphosphate. But then you also have a little bit of it going to other things. So what can it do? Um, basically, it can be transported out of the chloroplast and be used for glycolysis. It can be transported out of the chloroplast and be used to make sucrose, which transports sugar in the plant. Or it can be used um, in the chloroplast to make starch. And that's also, depending on the conditions, the dominant thing that happens. So what about the regulation of these enzymes? 
So we already talked about LaVisca, right? It was regulated by the CO2, and it was regulated by this transition state analog um, that you occurs in the dark. So in the stroma, where these occur, in the light, you have pH going up from the photophosphorylation, and it's going up from about 7 to 8. And you have magnesium increasing from about 2 to 5. It gets transported out of the thylakoid into the stroma um, in the light. So the two red ones are the unique reactions in plants compared to anything else. Um, but all of these are regulated by pH, magnesium, and by thyrodoxin, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So I personally have worked with these, um, these enzymes regulate in the chloroplast drama regulated by these. There is a um, picture in your book, but um, you'll see the activity profile is very dependent on pH and magnesium with a nice increase in velocity um, when you have this increase in pH and magnesium. Now what about this activation by reduction? So this is happening, it's coupled to photosystem 1, which you'll remember had reduced ferrodoxin. And I mentioned in that case that it was soluble. And so that soluble uh, ferrodoxin can then, on your proteins, um, there's another protein, small soluble one, called thyrodoxin. And so the reduced ferrodoxin from your photosystem can then reduce um, thyrodoxin from the oxidized to the reduced form. Did you guys talk about thyrodoxin at all in the first part? Okay. But you talked about this all the time, and we have. So basically, this is a special molecule. Again, someone here at Berkeley, Bob Buchanan, did a lot of work, that, like groundbreaking work on thyrodoxin. Um, and so this um, small soluble protein is taking the ferrodoxin reducing power and then it's oxidized and then, sorry, <laughs> as it's oxidized, it reduces ferrodoxin to the reduced form. And then that interacts with your protein of interest, which is up here. Each one of these has these disulfide bridges and in, bi in biochemistry, when we're looking at enzymes in the stroma that we know have the potential to be regulated, but we don't know in this way if they are, we actually look for the presence of these di potential disulfide bridges. And we know right, that this is coming from a cysteine. So you can actually get the amino acid sequence and look for where those cysteines are. And often they're even spaced in a certain way. But sometimes, because it's three-dimensional, you don't always know right, with what would bring it next to each other um, in the three-dimensional structure. So here we have the reduced thyrodoxin, and now it is used to reduce um, the group on the enzyme. And so now you have reduced um, uh, disulfide groups on your enzyme, and it's active. In the dark, this goes back and it's oxidized. So you have these mechanisms that are all coupled to light. You have that pH increase, the magnesium increase, and you're only having this um, ferrodoxin, right, which is reduced in the light, which is then going through this series to be able to uh, reduce your enzyme. And all three of these are um, happening, all the pH, the magnesium, and the activation for these enzymes here. So we talked about um, C3 um, photosynthesis, but now we're going to talk about C4 cam and photorespiration, which can happen all the time. So for carboxylation, um, I'm just going back to this idea about Rubisco that it also, so this is its standard carboxylation reaction, but it can also um, act on oxygen. So in this case, it produces phosphoglycolate and 3 phosphoglycerate. This is familiar to us, right? It can go on and do productive things, but phosphoglycolate can't. 
it's metabolically um, unproductive. So it has to be converted into something productive. And the thing that's amazing about rubisco is that it's not like this just happens once in a while in seafood plants. It's actually happening almost every three to four times the reaction is occurring. So the affinity, the Km of rubisco for CO2 is nine micromolar and its Km for oxygen is much higher, but in the atmosphere you have so much more oxygen than CO2, so that's why it's actually happening. So it evolved when you didn't have this, this much oxygen, but now we do, and so it actually, we have this issue of having to deal with the oxygenation reaction. So C3 plants have to deal with this, um, and this is called photorespiration. And um, again, this gets at this idea of temperature and CO2. So when CO2 increases, it would favor the carboxylation, but temperature kinetically favors the oxygenation reaction. So in photorespiration, um, we have uh, the main whole part of what I'm talking about here is recycling that unproductive product, the phosphoglycolate. So in this case, the glycolate has to basically be converted to serine. Um, and then the serine is converted back to 3-phosphoglycerate to be productive in the Kelvin cycle. So it's getting transported as glycolate into the peroxy zone and then through there to glycine, which could be transferred to the mitochondria. It releases CO2 and then, which is um, part of why we call it photorespiration, and then it can go through glycerate back to be phosphoglycerate and to be useful. So the take home message for this is that there's a cost, right? So there's a cost of ATP, and um, also that you have to do this in order to make this product useful. <coughs> I'm just wondering what happened. Oh, okay, here's the clipper quiz. <laughs> but where is it? Um, in C4 photosynthesis, so we were talking about C3, they get around this problem with photorespiration. So this is like corn and sugarcane and grasses, tropical grasses, by having spatial separation. So there's two different types of cells, mesophyll and bundle sheet. And so what happens here, if we just focus on this part, rubisco is not in the mesophyll cell. So the CO2 comes in and it gets stored as malate. Then the rubisco is actually in this bundle sheet cell, so the malate gets transported in here and that's where rubisco happens. So rubisco, where the rubisco activity happens and, and actually assimilates the CO2. So, What's good about this is that you actually don't need to worry about the oxygen concentration here because this enzyme right at the top does not have oxygenase activity. And it has a super high catalytic rate, so it's very efficient in using CO2, converts it to malate, moves it into this cell where rubisco does its work. So in this case, the energy cost um, is, you get, um, but it does cost, so in this case for C3 plants, um, you get three ATP per CO2, and then for C4 plants you get five ATPs. And um, this has to do with, um, right, that you, uh, how you're actually doing this reaction, right, that you don't have to recycle the glycolate, and so you're actually getting more ATPs per CO2. However, there's a cost here um, in this, um, enzyme right here, which requires two ATPs um, to do this reaction. And the, if you're ever looking at something like this, when you know it's a cost of around two ATPs, it's when it goes all the way to AMP, not ADP, and pyrophosphate is coming out. So for the purpose of this class, we always call that a two ATP cost. So essentially, when you have the C4 photosynthesis, what happens is you don't have the oxygenase re um, reaction happening because you have the spatial separation, and you don't have to worry about um, that um, glycolate recycling. Yeah? So are those, under energy costs, five versus three ATPs? Is that how much we're using up? So would that make uh, C4 worse if we're using more ATPs? 
Yeah, so let's go back here. So right here, we're actually putting in an ATP. Um, if we go back to the original. So it's a little tricky to do it in terms of like how you add them all up. But um, I think what I'll do is put a review for next time for you on it. But essentially here, right, you're using up nine ATP. And then you're also having to recycle every one time. So you actually have, um, where, uh, right here. So even though this is using two ATP, um, so I have to apologize, we don't go into enough detail to really get at this. So it has to do with how many times you're cycling with the glyophyllite, like the light cycle, right? If it's once every like four cycles of it that you're actually producing it, then you have that extra energy cost versus here you have that, but it has to do with how quickly this is recycled. So the, the net total is this. So what I can do is add more details for you guys that I'm not talking about here in lecture to help you get to this cost. Yeah, I apologize for that. So if we're looking at um, the iClicker quiz, the question is, if you have increasing CO2 due to climate change, with no temperature change, which types of plants or any, right, would you expect to have an increased CO2 assimilation and growth? C4. With increased CO2. C4. Mine's red. Mm, it's red. Oh, she hasn't started yet. Oh, there we go. But um, so let's look at this. Oh. It's not showing, sorry. So basically, right. that should be the C3. And the reason, right? The reason for that is the C3 uh, rubisco is happening in the same place, um, right? It's in the same, it can either do the oxygenase or it can do the. Um, I just want to get this out of the way. It can do the oxygenase or it can do the carboxylase. Whereas the C4 plants, they're separated, so it doesn't matter. It's already operating at its highest rate for fixing CO2. Whereas the um, in the C3 plants, right, it's a competition between oxygen and CO2. So we'll look at that again in a minute. Um, I'm not seeing it. So is she gonna give us the point? <laughs> Why do we only have the? Yeah, you're right. Okay, so it should be C3, so just quickly let's look back at that because obviously it didn't come across. So for C3, right, so we're looking at the rubisco activity, go back to here, right, it could do either the carboxylase 
or the oxygenase. And because it can do that, right, and so the more CO2 it has, the more it would do the carboxylase activity, whereas the temperature impacts the increases oxygenase. So in this case, when I talked about in this question, it was only CO2 that was being impacted. Instead, when we go to the C4, okay, let's go forward. Right, so here, now we're look, looking at the oxygenase, okay? So normally, for this go, right, once every three to four times, you're actually um, using oxygen, and then you have that cost associated with the glycolate cycle. And it's all about this ratio, right, of CO2 to O2 and that availability. So as CO2 is increasing, you're able to use more of it when you're in the C3 plant. When you're in the C4, you're actually physically separated. So you're basically, this is already um, doing everything that it can and functioning really well. Rubisco is not competing with oxygen here. So it seems like probably what you guys thought is just there's more CO2 so this could do more of the reaction. Okay, so I'll just give you all that point. Um, because I, I told you at the very beginning, right, if it wasn't, if it's 50-50, then it's on me, right? So we, we're gonna spend some more time right now discussing this. So in this case, right, it was really about the competition, okay? So the competition was such that for the Rubisco in a C3 plant, oxygen can compete well. The more CO2 you have, every increase makes a big difference. In this case, it's basically already saturated, and that's the word I didn't already tell you. And so getting a higher level of CO2 isn't gonna do much more here. And the other thing is, in this case as well, um, you don't have to worry about the oxygenase activity, okay? So the key point that you needed to know to get the right answer, I think, was that this is basically already saturated, okay? So that's on me, so you all get that point. Bless you. Um, and then that was the end for, you can look at your um, basically study aids, but you want to know these general reactions and enzymes, how it's regulated, and then the difference in the different kinds. We want to talk about the CAM plan.